Hello everyone and welcome to what will be your final um, online lecture of this module. Um, I'll just get started um, and I will um, where's my share button? I've got another one. And I'll give you a couple of updates as well once I've got everything unloaded because we all know by now that it takes a while for my computer to work. Hopefully you should be seeing this now. Uh, or at least the, the kind of first slide uh, before we get started. So let's try this. There we go. OK, so this is your last kind of online session, which is basically a run through of what we'll go through in class in, on Wednesday, sorry. Um, and then you have your summer break. Um, please remember to keep an eye on timetable.sunland.ac.uk to find out when your next sessions are um, next semester um, or to use the timetabling app itself. Um, please also, you know, have a good Christmas break, but remember that your assignments are due um, in January. Um, you have a 2000 word word count, so please do get on with them. I'll be talking about more with you about them in person on Wednesday, but as always, you can find the details for the assignments on your canvas.sunland.ac.uk space um, and then go down the click on your module code, which is EEM102, um, Game Culture. And then down the side uh, bar on the left hand side, click on assignments and that's where you'll find all of your details, which I'll be talking to you about on Wednesday. Um, and I should be emailing you as well, um, which should go out uh, for Monday morning if I've timetabled them correctly, but expect emails from you soon. OK, um, so this final session then is on the video games industry, crunch culture and platform capitalism. Um, obviously, um, last um, week, we started to look at kind of the pressures going on in the industry. Um, this is more kind of a look at those kind of breaking news stories around crunch culture. Um, in particular, term we'll be focusing on a, a lot in our session. Here we go. So this session, we'll be looking at developing our understanding of how the video games industry operates, developing knowledge of the impact on of culture, Crunch culture, sorry, um, if I say that five times faster, I may get into trouble. Um, and to understand the concept of platform capitalism generally. So this is our first task. And again, I'll leave this up for about a minute for you just to kind of absorb it without me talking at you. Um, so the first task is to imagine that you're playing The Sims and I'm just getting a little demo of it if you've never played The Sims before, but it's kind of one of those. Um, games um, that are so ubiquitous that everyone sort of knows of it and, and the function of it and that simulator game from EA. Um, so we're going to imagine that we're playing the Sims and you're in control of a worker whose career is focused upon making games at a computer. Um, what happens if you ignore their needs? What would be the psychological impact on that worker? Um, so you, you need to talk about their needs um, and then we'll have a wider discussion about the psychological kind of impact if you let all of their kind of health bars and, and needs meters run down low. So again, I'll leave this up just for a minute, of, well, 30 seconds or so, for you to um, take this in and, and start thinking ahead for our task on Wednesday. So after we've had this kind of discussion, well, we'll be talking about psychological needs. Your next task will be uh, to envision that you are a manager of a new business with five members of staff. Uh, you want to make a contract for their employment. What rights do you need to consider? And this is very much something that we'll be looking at today. The fundamental um, operating of contracts of what's expected of the worst workforce and your rights. Um, so again, I'll leave this up for you to consider. There we go. 
So I'll further reading, and this is going to be where quite a lot of your quotes and case studies come from um, this session, uh, which is a book by Jamie Woodcock, which is available in the library, um, is online, and I think I believe is a physical copy as well. Um, it marks at the arcade, consoles, controls, and class struggles. So if you need help with your assignments or you need some extra references with your assignments as you're writing them, some of you will be going home um, outside of Sunderland or outside of the Northeast. Uh, for Christmas, so if you're worried about references, please do use our online text, and this is a very good one. Uh, Marks at the Arcade uh, by Jamie Woodcock. Um, Jamie's a fantastic researcher um, on the kind of landscape for workers' rights in the games industry currently. Um, and it's a it's a really good book generally for your assignments and will be very helpful, I'm sure, throughout your, your kind of tenure um, on this degree pathway. So last session, we looked at the networked individual um, and that was kind of one of our final points that we looked at because it very much leads onto ideas of platform capitalism. Um, so platform capitalism is in particular we've seen um, from the use of um, making platforms, yes, in a crude sense, social media, but just generally brand building um, through um, the internet and being networked. Um, this very much leads on to a nice kind of segue onto your semester next year, next um, calendar year, not next academic year, on esports and, and branding and marketing strategies. Um, and this very much um, links to the idea that we are we're always connected, we're always online. That means that we can always uh, be building our brands and selling to people all over the world, um, and we can always be doing that. Um, and there's no kind of switch off or downtime period. Um, we have that shrink space, what we talked about earlier in the year, so you can get your messages out globally. Um, and that's a really big kind of um, plus for people who want to expand their audiences online. Um, but it also means that it's easy for employers to carry out surveillance of our work. Uh, we all have to be online. You can see if someone's available on Teams, their emails, are they responding or reading WhatsApp messages or even Facebook messages? Um, it's a, it's a world where surveillance and, and tracking workers is very easy um, to even um, logging in um, is has to be done more through a computer system than the old days of time cards, if time cards were missing, um, it was up to the employer um, a lot of the time, whereas now um, monitoring of employees is much more commonplace. Um, there is a rarely an off mode from work. Um, even social media use is often monitored by employees. You'll see workers saying um, my views are my own, not my employers. But even if they are their own, it's unlikely they're going to be having a rant about their, their boss, for example, um, on these platforms. So even and still they're having to kind of self-censor or edit their own kind of posts and, and publications um, for what it may suit um, an employer or not. Um, it's just an intrinsic consideration that they have to do. Um, so this is a reminder from last week because it was a real key quote, uh, Wellman and Rainey's, we call networked individualism an operating system because it describes the way in which people connect, communicate and exchange information. We also use the phrase because it underlines the fact that societies like computer systems have network structures that provide opportunities and constraints, rules and procedures. So crunch culture is a key term that is used a huge amount in, within the games industry. Um, and it's where workers are forced to work long hours, often without pay. Um, we, workers may be forced to do this through explicit demands or feel forced to work for long hours due to a culture of high pressure in the workplace. Um, crunch culture in the games industry generally happens during a specific, specific period of games development, usually six months to a year before launch, sometimes in the 18 months. It's when they set a deadline and then everyone starts obsessively working to that deadline. Um, and then the initial months after launch, um, there is further crunch still uh, to add content um, such as bugs, uh, to fix bugs, glitches, sometimes commonly known as patches. Um, Cyberpunk 27 being an example of a case study that we'll be talking about a lot later on as it was quite a tremendous amount of patches and workers working around the clock for many, many months after launch to, to bring the game up to kind of standard. Uh, we also have a gig economy, which tends to affect um, young graduates or just um, kind of that 18 to 25 grouping quite a lot. 
um, because the gig economy is a labour market, but it's dominated by insecure short-term contracts, such as zero-hours contracts rather than secure jobs with long-term contracts. This may be working in social media and might be helping out at a game studio and maybe jumping from game studio to game studio. But it's something that really impacts the digital economy, the digital media economy, particularly freelance um, people who do filming freelance, for example, it really impacts. So it's a really important um, issue and affects all industries. But it's a real um, contemporary issue in the digital economy. Um, this form of labour has become commonplace generally, though, as I said, um, since the 2008 credit crunch. Uh, this was kind of the first big economic downturn that we've had after many, many years of boom, um, or what's commonly known as boom um, when a capitalist economy is doing well and there's quite a lot of growth. Um, since 2008, we've generally had far less growth um, and far less boom times, even even just sorting that, uh, putting aside COVID. Um, the gig economy generally is a poor deal for workers who do not have security. Um, zero hours contracts and insecure contracts are major barriers for employment for mothers, carers and disabled people, or just in particular, um, because it, 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 they're often sold as very flexible, particularly for kind of students, but actually a lot of the time you don't actually have a huge amount of save when you work. It's more that you'll just get summoned. Um, it obviously depends on the workplace, but a lot of the time it's just kind of understood that you would be there. Um, this obviously may clash with lectures, um, but for, if you're a carer in any sort of capacity, you can't just always drop things and, and get you may need that income. Um, so they kind of get phased out because they can't join the full time economy. They often can't join the part time um, economy because there's too many hours, but zero hour contracts, there's not always often a huge amount of say. Um, so you get kind of different workers just kind of who want to be workers, but just completely shut out. Um, so this is a discussion. Again, I'll leave this up for just 30 seconds or so, um, so that you can process it without me giving you information at the same time, um, which is just how many hours a week should someone be expected to work if they have a full time contract? Do you think how many days holiday a year should a worker on a permanent full time contract have? So this is the rights that we currently have um, in the UK. Well, I'm going to say specifically England because Scotland, um, Ireland and Wales often have very different laws, in particular Scotland, um, whose power is diverged through Holyrood. So if you're ever studying things like media law, for example, um, there will be differences. You can't just apply English laws to Scottish law. So that's just one thing to flag at this stage. Um, and it's... It's interesting as well because we've had many, um, because we have a global media economy, you may, for example, have freelance workers, which is not uncommon, particularly during um, COVID, um, working for an international company, but they're based in the UK, at which point the rights get slightly different. Um, if they're a company, if they're having an employee in the UK, it should generally follow English law if they're in England specifically. Um, however, it's not. it can sometimes be difficult for people to keep track of. Um, and this is why this is going to lead us much later on to our discussions about unions and why they're really important. But in English law, we say that no worker can work for more than 48 hours a week as an average. And the average being key, so there may be flexibility in that um, and may fluctuate. There are some um, exemptions um, and these exemptions usually tend to apply to emergency service workers not for instance people working in the games industry or in social media or in digital technologies generally there is an opt-out system where workers can work for longer if they want to but you can't be fired for refusing to opt out that would be something that you would be if you went to a tribunal you would win essentially um, almost all workers generally are entitled to at least 5.6 weeks paid holiday a year. Um, this may amount to less for those on irregular hours. 
um, but people who work irregular hours are entitled to paid time off for every hour that they work. Um, many of the most, this is again, um, is some of your further reading, which I'll go through next week because it's really important that we kind of drill down and get you used to it, reading sources. And I'll be going through Harvard referencing again. But one of the kind of key quotes I'll be looking at is many of the most technologically connected workers have jobs built around creative effort rather than manufacturing or standardised paper pushing. Um, and I'll be showing you a link to this um, article, uh, which is on the networked individual in particular. And this is an expansion on the concept that we've been looking at. I won't open it right now because we guarantee that it will close on a Mac, but I'll be taking you through on Wednesday and again how to source and reference. Um, so workers' rights again, there's going to be a discussion. Um, what are some rights you expect if you start a new job? What are some things? Um, a friend of mine just got offered a new job recently and was shocked at some of the things that she thought were standard but weren't. So I'm just going to let you think about some of the things, do a little list and then we'll go through them together. There we go. And we're going to be looking at in particular social media. Social media often intersects with the games community in many different ways. Um, so, for instance, Twitch streams in particular are a way that people and fans try and essentially make money out of their hobbies. Um, it's not uncommon for um, anyone interested in digital culture to end up, for instance, working in social media or a games industry. Um, social media has been a really key kind of part of our marketing economy. Um, and it'll be something that you'll have to be think about when you do um, project proposals for kind of a sports event. How are you going to market or how are you going to make use of social media? Um, other modules that I know that are going on this week um, on separate degrees are doing a streaming for a charity event. Um, so social media is a really key thing for promoting events, particularly in the digital world. Why? Because it's a digital tool and we use what we know um, and that's how we find like minded people. Um, but it is really important to be aware of because often what ends up happening is people put hundreds, if not thousands of hours into social media to build up their portfolio to show that they understand marketing. But that is all unpaid labour because you're expected to have a portfolio of work um, as you apply for a job. If someone goes on, if someone lists, for instance, a social media manager job um, and you just kind of list um, your qualifications but don't show that you are experienced in social media campaigns um it's you know, it, it makes you your chance of being hired much less likely you have to have a body of work it's it's very common expect commonly expected but how do you get that body of work most of it is, is free labor and people that's not always appreciated when getting into these industries it's just how much free labor is done just understanding tools such as like Photoshop, making memes in your own time, things that are thought of commonly as fun for fans. They're also a labour and it's also an incredible amount of work. Um, so fans themselves can essentially face some forms of crunch culture. Um, I refer to just obsessive love of their hobbies or trying to make a career out of their hobby, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, social media has become an important area in the economy. Most businesses need social media to promote their brand. Um, this is really key in digital economies. For instance, you would not expect, for instance, a games community not be online or using social media. They'll post videos, they'll post streams, they'll post Q and A's. It's really important because their their audience they use digital technologies like the consoles, so they're going to be using other digital technologies and, and follow on. Um, and most most marketing has shifted online anyway. Um, so they really have to make use of those tools. But working social media can be very insecure. Uh, this is because while many companies need social media, not all employers appreciate exactly what goes in, uh, what work goes into building a brand. It's still very undervalued in terms of the labour you put into what you get out of it. Um, and a lot of workers in social media end up in the gig economy, which we, we talked about in the previous slides, um, and often working freelance contracts. Additionally, many people in the world of social media are expected to carry out unpaid um, labour to build up their own personal brand support for those. And again, a discussion, I'll leave up going in 30 seconds. Um, this is very discussion oriented as we work towards kind of 
developing your thoughts a lot more on this ahead of your assignments and we're going to have a lot more kind of workshop time um, in the session on Wednesday because I want to make sure that you're all happy before you go off for Christmas. Obviously I'll be around if you need to message me at all but it's just making sure that you got everything that you need. So the discussions that we'll have are does technology help workers to disenfranchise them? Is it possible for workers to ever truly be offline? And think about what we said at the start of this kind of lecture. And what opportunities does new media bring? Um, I'm going to share some really important case studies, um, again, which you can bring into your assignments, but it's important as I've, I've talked about in recent sessions, um, the feedback that you got from your assignments, it's really important um, to keep um, developing those ideas of case studies, um, things that link to wider themes and theoretical approaches that we discuss. Um, and this is a really key example uh, of games developers themselves talking about their experiences with crunch culture. So you often have um, the, the crunch culture in the insecure jobs as people are trying to build their portfolios. But then when you get into the more established um, areas, in particular the games industry, the insecurity may stop, however, the crunch culture goes up. Um, and so it's not really a happy or healthy industry in that sense. Um, and we're going to talk about how these two positions um, interlink as well very soon uh, as I have an interview with a former worker um, who was young, just getting settled in his career and how that kind of transition from wanting to start out your career and find a secure spot actually also makes you really vulnerable to exploitation. So here is the interview. So this had to remain anonymous um, it was at a company based in England um, and this was from a worker it had to remain anonymous because they signed an NDA and they're not actually allowed to talk about overtly their experiences until after that NDA breaks um, so this was an interview that was collected um, from a um, someone who I, I, I know um, and contributed very kindly to this lecture um, to talk about their experiences within working in the games industry and it was kind of their first games industry job and it was enough to make them never want to work in the games industry again um, and in their words um, they said that a typical week had hours that were a minimum of 60 hours but could go up to 80 to 90 hours so that's already over um, what we were talking about with the limit and uh, with, with your men to work in England um, and they said that I only worked one 38 hour week while I was contracted and that was my first week on the job. So you had those, um, it was the first week, it was an induction and it was very quickly, um, the contract was kind of very quickly, the rules what we signed were ignored. Um, they continued, yes, I experienced a crunch culture, there was this hidden expectation that you would do it no matter what because there are so many other people that would do this job if you cannot handle the hours. This created a very toxic overworked work culture. So you had kind of young people really wanting, and young employees really wanting to finally make their break with a steady income in the games industry and work their way up. Um, and that meant that they were really vulnerable because everyone gets starry eyed with the games industry. We love it, absolutely. Um, but it means that employees felt enabled um, to exploit workers, um, but by the threat, well, we can get someone else to do it. Um, if you don't suffer this abuse, someone else will because you want to make it in the industry and we have all the power. And that was very much the kind of culture that was faced. Um, the interviewee continued, I feel like the all the time slash extra hours you were asked to do were an expectation and not an option, even though we only had to work 38 a week within our contracts. We could not question it or ask to do it without backlash. They continued. Now, there were no unions or legislation in place to protect you. 
from their crunch hours or culture due to the rose tinted lenses that many people have about the industry. The unspoken answer would always be there are people lining up for a job like this. Be grateful for what you have. You would have been paid off for turning down extra hours, made redundant, and they would have hired someone else. So it's that disposable culture. They continued that the turnaround in the studio and industry is known to be very high due to the lack of unions and work-life balance. The only people who seem to stick it out for longer in higher positions with much more reasonable pay and power over their hours. Um, so that is kind of the key um, point, that those, there's a really high turnover in the industry. We know that many industries in the UK face this right now. Teaching, for instance, has an incredibly high um, t uh, turnover rate where many, um, it's, it's over half of the staff, um, teaching staff quit within the first five years of getting their qualifications. Um, it, this is not uncommon in the industry uh, and with industries. Um, we have a very high work culture. The UK has some of the highest working hours in Europe, um, the longest working hours, sorry, in Europe. And this creates quite a lot of pressure. But in the games industry, what we're seeing is a real extreme where you're talking about could go up to 80 or 90 hours a week. That's an incredible amount of time. Um, there was also suspicions when I spoke to this interviewee um, that um, there was surveillance being used. Um, the TVs were always off and they believed that they were functioning as, as cameras and were surveillance monitors. Um, there were what was seemed at first as nice gestures to kind of placate um, staff by bringing in pizzas to the to the office. What this was though, and it meant was that it wasn't a treat, it meant that people couldn't leave the office and they had to eat at their desks and continue to work. Um, and whether this was justified um, was actually happening or not, there was such a psychological burden on workers that they began to feel unsafe and suspicious of every kind of uh, interaction with their bosses um, and that they, there wasn't that kind of sincerity and that they were just kind of stuck at their, at their desks constantly working. Again, this is an example of what we'll look at. Um, Bio is a case study and I've linked another article as well in your Canvas space to, to read about. Um, this is a discussion about the concept of Bioware magic and Bioware um, has produced um, a plethora of games um, becoming really famous um, for Knights in the Old Republic, but then in particular perfecting Mass Effect, Dragon Age, um, and then more recently launching and failing with Anthem, um, and, and recently um, doing a successful Mass Effect remaster. Um, so Bioware has been around for a very long time. Um, EA bought Bioware in 2007, so it was one of the biggest deals in the um, games industry at the time. A huge amount of money was pumped into to Bioware, so they're one of the biggest studios, the biggest names. It's commonly thought that Bioware has a bit of magic and that games are really soulful, that people really connect with their narratives. However, bugs are very common in the game. And it's thought that this is the, the, the combined um, heart of the game series with some of the bugs um, and some of the more goofy aspects were what were known as Bioware magic. And that's commonly a term that was thrown around. How did Bioware make games so good? Well, it was Bioware magic. Actually, what Bioware talked about was having an incredibly um, ridiculous crunch culture um, where people were just forced to work. Um, in the kind of Bioware um, secrets book where um, developers reflect on the, the, the anniversary of Bioware uh, being established, um, they realised actually that there were some workers who barely had a couple of hours of paternity leave um, um, and missed um, the birth of their child uh, because they were working so 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 horrendously um, to get games out. Um, some had accidents such as broken legs and needing to cover for workers and powering through. Um, and it's really um, an intense, it was really an intense time, but it would always be reduced to, oh, it's Bioware magic, not actually the stories of people who were suffering under crunch culture or having to work extremely long hours. It was just commonly referred to as Bioware magic. Until Jason Shreer, a journalist after um, the launch of Anthem and also with Andromeda, wrote articles exposing um, Bioware as having a, a strong cult culture, crunch culture. And even recently, um, Bioware has been accused of actions that have included union busting or trying to prevent colleague, um, um, workers from joining unions, unions commonly agitating for better working rights and conditions. 
So we're going to read this letter. This is a very historic letter from what is EA Spouse. Um, and it was written many years ago, well over a decade ago now, um, from the partner of a games developer at EA. Uh, the author of this writing was also a games developer, interestingly enough. Um, but they're stating that there is a particular culture going on at EA Games, um, which is leading to horrendous crunch. Um, so I want you to read this open letter, which is about the very personal impact what crunch culture has on families. And I want you to look at what concerns are expressed in the letter, and what power dynamics are captured in the lecture. And again, I'm going to leave this up for 30 seconds or so for you to have a look at and maybe have a scan through. Apologies that I can't open it up. Um, and it's also, the link should be working on PowerPoint, but just if you ever uh, need to search for this, literally just typing in ES Spouse in, in Google will bring it up as one of the first links. So this is one of our case studies, Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk sorry, 2077, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it was a game which was incredibly popular now, but was not at the time of its launch in 2021. But it was released by the highly rated studio, CD Projekt Red, um, and they created the, the hugely popular Witcher games, um, which were adapted from the book and, and now is a TV show. Um, but Cyberpunk's release has been delayed several times and its eventual launch was well with mixed reception due to the poor performance of the game, particularly on older consoles. I actually had it on the PS5 and it crashed. I lost count at 40 times on the first weekend. Uh, and I mean, fully crashed occasionally was more, about 50% of those times was restarting the, the console itself as well. Um, the studio is now facing several lawsuits, one of which the biggest of one has been settled. I'm not entirely sure about the others yet. Um, so I need to check that out very soon. But last about a week ago, the, most, the, the, the biggest lawsuit was settled um, about where they were challenged over the, the poor state of the game, but there, are, there were several ongoing lawsuits at the time. Um, and this was just due to the amount of glitches upon release, uh, the crashes, the fact that it wasn't working um, at all um, on quite a lot of platforms. Um, and there are now fears that studios, if they're challenged, are implementing crunch to fix games. Um, and this was a big fear and still is a big fear about Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk have had incredible, it's two years on, but there's been an incredible amount of patches. They've released new content, new DLC to really bring it up to standard. But there are questions of whether crunch has been tackled or not. Some of the words from the studio ahead have been more positive than what they were during the initial kind of crunch project before it was lost or launched. Um, however, there's still questions being faced about what workers have had to go through at CD Projekt Red. Um, there were also widespread reports of crunch at the studio well before the launch and before each previous delay. So every time it got delayed, which was a minimum of three times, there was a crunch period leading up to that. That's that's an incredible amount of hours um, and psychological hardship for workers to endure. Uh, Joshua Shreya, who wrote for Bloomberg, um, a, a big expose on this, stated that employees were working long hours, even though Winsky told staff that overtime wouldn't be mandatory for cyberpunk on Cyberpunk 2077, but when the studio head. Um, Shreya continued that more than a dozen workers said they felt pressured to put in extra hours by their managers of co-workers anyway. Um, it was found that staff worked over 13 hours a day, five days a week. This generally amounted to 65 hours a week. In the UK, the legal limit is 48 hours. Delays made the crunch prolonged. However, the game needed more time to be developed. But this is not a catch-22 situation. Games can be made without crunch, but it depends on how well the studio is managed, how realistic, flexible deadlines are, more pressures developers face from those higher up to meet those deadlines. The game's poor condition on release was not reflecting the workers, but of the overall project management. And that's the key thing with crunch culture. If crunch is happening, it's generally because the project's been really badly managed and the fact that crunch has been implemented in the first place. Um, and there are a lot of questions over how necessary crunch is really to get a project done anyways or if it's more of a psychological tool um something i'll be talking about with mark darrow's blog on this which is all on your canvas space 
You have an article to read um, again, which is on Cyberpunk 2077's Crunch Culture, so that you can really get a feel and experience for it. Um, so and um, and so you can understand what we've been talking about. Where do you think the problems with crunch culture start? And why is crunch a factor in video game projects? Another case study is The Last of Us Part Two, um, which won numerous awards upon its um, launch. Um, in 2020, it actually won the uh, Naughty Dog behind um, The Last of Us Part Two, actually won the Best Studio of the Year award at the 2020 Gordon Joyce Stake Awards after the release of Last of Us 22. However, this was very ironic um, because throughout the development of The Last of Us 2, there was a crunch culture at the studio. The crunch at the studio was so bad that some workers were hospitalised. This has had an impact on development as developers could no longer continue in their force due to the poor conditions. And so Naughty Dog had to fill the positions with people who were inexperienced. Our interviewee talked about that high turnover and it was only kind of studio heads um, and those at the, the higher up you got that had that security. This is a, an example of that and another case study that backs up that information. So here are some statistics and you can see the sources kind of at the bottom, which is that 74% of games workers are not paid overtime, but 90% can be expected to work extra hours. 53% of games workers believe that the skill sets could secure better wages and conditions in another industry. 45% of women feel that they have or will at some stage encounter barriers to their career progression because of their gender. 45% of women have experienced some form of bullying or harassment whilst working in games or being associated with the industry. Two thirds of games companies worldwide do not have mechanisms in place to deal with harassment or abuse. And these are statistics that we'll get into and discuss what are those impacts and what are those dynamics? What do you think this reveals? Um, and, and do you think that's a fair deal from these statistics from employers? Um, and, and what would you, if just under half of women have experienced some form of bullying or harassment, for example, is how would you describe that workplace or that industry to work? Um, and do you think it's something that, you know, if you're a young woman, do you think that young women can really think about joining that or the is a thing so toxic that they're not going to want to work in that? And that itself impacts our future of games, our discussion um, in week six on Game Again. If all of that kind of different voices in games are leading, then we are leaving, then we stop, stop getting uh, diverse games and we only keep getting the same content um, because the same the same group of people are making them with the same life experiences. Um, because the average were in the games industry is in their 20s or 30s, there is an expectation that they will to press to build careers, will not have families or outside commitments and therefore will be perfect to work long hours with minimal complaints. This culture is also reinforced by the stunning growth of the games industry. Games are so popular now that employees want staff that if they don't like the conditions, they can easily be replaced by someone fresh out of uni. Uh, and this is how crunch culture and the gig economy becomes unsustainable and exploitative of workers. The task, again, I'll leave it up for you, which is to list the ways in which an insecure employment contract may negatively impact someone's life. You get a contract and it's a it's a temporary contract and you don't know how many hours you're going to work. Um, what what are some ways that that may impact you? Is it good um, for your time of life or is it is it is it or actually do you think it's very negative and what are those negatives? Is it different to what you would want now as compared to say five years from now? Do you think your priorities may be different? This is, we're going to in particular look at the history of trade unions. Uh, we talked a lot about neoliberalism and the origins of neoliberalism. Um, this coincided with a kind of uh, an ideological battle with trade unions in this company. And trade unions are workers um, who will form collective bodies in a workplace or in an industry to agitate for better rights and to support the rights of workers. So unions may take this action in many different ways, which we'll look at. 
Um, however, union GEs have generally faced um, tougher kind of laws uh, to vote for actions in, in England in the last kind of 10 years. But here's what some trade unions can do. Trade unions are designed to advocate for the working body and there are many different priorities um, that they work for, such as holiday rights, maternity or paternity leave, fair wages, safe working conditions, including hours worked in that, not just health and safety of, of where someone leaves the bucket, but also if, how many hours you're working and the detriment that has on your health. And also fair treatment. There are some limits to trade unions. Um, they require a majority turnout for any action. Um, years of anti-trade union laws have meant that people feel disconnected from unions. They're not always representative of progressive identity. Some unions are better than others on this, on diversity in particular. Uh, but a poor representative in your industry or in particular in your workplace can mean that an entire workforce feels alienated. So if your union rep isn't advocating your behalf or you don't feel that they're particularly friendly or welcoming or supportive, um, that can lead to a substantial amount of issues with you actually trying to um, get um, union uh, support or help. There's been opposition to trade unions. Um, some employers We've talked about a little bit with Bioware engaging in union busting. This isn't uncommon charge against games industries. Um, employers are all, quite a few of them have been associated with union busting. Um, the government historically and more recently will look at, and the games industry as a whole has been involved in union busting. Um, and this is a great clip that I love to show all my students whenever I do this so that you can see uh, why unions um, are, st are still good for people if they're especially at degree level before you've assuming before you've entered your career to learn about unions the pros and cons and then decide upon you if, if that's something that you want to join or not and, and, and it helps inform you and educate you just to, uh, as well as your own rights for the future. Um, another task is to imagine that the student body is striking over two long lecture hours you're absolutely sick to death of me you hate me and you want to get abolished and long lecture hours uh, you've been tasked with organising the strike. How do you go about it? Make a rough plan, think about aims and what outcomes are acceptable. Um, well, this isn't too dissimilar to when you have to do the Super Mario campaign. Um, it's that kind of idea, I think, about how something is applied and how something operates. And again, I'll leave this up for 30 seconds for you to consider. Uh, worker strikes movements generally have, are inspired others in this area, in particular students to strike um, and this in turn has inspired kind of the games industry because we've had more unionisation in the games industry. In the England actually led partly by Jamie uh, Woodcock whose book at the start I recommended for this, mo this um, session um, and it's inspired action um, on things such as like climate change. Um, we're going to look at this kind of utopian portrayal of the game world, which is in particular a little case study of GameStev. It, um, it was a game that was released for Windows two decades ago, and it was re-released as a mobile game. It's actually a sim management game, um, similar to kind of the task that you did at the start. Um, it focuses on developing games, not looking after people, however, which means that it has a fairly utopian idea of what the games industry is like. And because people are really enthusiastic about games and love games, often, we romanticise the content we get from games industries anyway, but actually it's a very hard industry. So we've got that kind of media idea versus the realities of working in the games industry. Woodcock said that um, when we turn on a video game, our intention is to play. Play is an interesting and difficult concept to try and understand under capitalism. Play by its very nature is an unproductive activity. In the wake of neoliberalism, we are constantly told about the virtues of work, not only while we are doing it, but needing to constantly prepare and train for it too. Play appears to run, run against this. It is often viewed as a waste of time that could be better spent developing our own human capital or some other bleak management speak. However, despite this emphasis on productivity through capitalism, realism, capitalist realism, play is still viewed as important in the context of human development. Um, and it's really interesting, as we talked about a little bit last week, how play... Um, has inspired such obsessions and the only way we can 
we can kind of cater to that demand is to create new games under capitalism, enforcing a crunch culture over something that's supposed to be fun. And, and that's how the system kind of perpetuates itself. There's also um, one of the final points to consider is the use of NDAs or non-disclosure agreements. Um, and this is where work is generally uh, forbidden from discussing um, issues in the workplace, including just things like what your salary is, um, or if you're part of a union is, is sometimes banned from being mentioned at workplace if you signed an NDA. Um, and this was commonly used by, and they got NDAs got particular attention by Harvey Weinstein, who would assault workers or people in the films industry and force them to sign NDAs by giving them a big payout um, so that they couldn't go to the police or report him. Um, this uh, practice of using non disclosure agreements is common and widespread in the games industry. And it was originally the idea to protect trade secrets, but we already have a law for that. So this really is hiding the reality of their use, which is often just to stop workers from discussing rights um, or what their other, what comparable contracts each other are on. Um, and NDA is a kind of one of the last kind of um, barriers for, that really kind of stop um, people from understanding their rights um, in the workplace um, and agitating for better or safer working conditions and hours, because some of the crunch hours we've talked about are, are incredibly unsafe. Um, there are unionising efforts to push back on NDAs and gain greater attention of workers' rights in the games industry. It's helping to change the tide. Um, and this, one of the kind of final points, really intersects with fan culture, because game developers often receive abuse for the quality of the game, but the quality of the game is determined by many factors and some can't be trialled until launch. But ultimately, as we said throughout many of our lectures, including the ones on Game Gear, is that nobody deserves abuse. Um, games devs are often working horrific hours to make a game launch at all. Um, and this links to the fan interactions. We've looked so much at fan interactions in the module with kind of figures, um, um, streamers, games devs, and how they're talking to each other. And this is how it perpetuates fan culture. So you've got a fan and they really want to join. They're such a fan that they work really hard to join the games industry. And then they get abuse from other fans because they're blamed for a bad game. And so you've got this kind of toxic cycle going on and on and on that kind of is a real threat to our games culture and community. And it's up to us to think about our interactions and whether it's just fans um, of the games industry, whether we can help make it better, but also things to be aware of when your interactions, when you're marketing um, game events too, or you're working with games developers to get an esports event off the ground. What we need generally is stronger oversight in the games industry, um, enforced fair laws. We have lots of good laws about workers' rights, but they're not commonly enforced, so we need better enforcement of them. And like I said, we need a non-toxic community to try and make things a little bit better and help you. Um, your kind of final task was to pick one of your favourite launches from the last five years, find how long was the development time, what was fan reaction, were there any bugs at launch, what were their patches, and were there reports of call and culture. And this is just a quick search, and then we'll all present our case studies. Um, so you must be fair, thoroughly sick to death of building your case studies, but I promise they are useful for your assignments. And as you've seen for your presentations, they've been very useful. That is the end of the lecture. I'll stop sharing my blank screen now. Um, thank you so much for listening, for watching, uh, for all your assignments, for all your incredible work this module. Um, you have survived your first module thus far. You've done very well, just one assignment left. And if you have any trouble at all, please do email me. It is what I'm here for. And you all know that I'm, I'm always pretty quick at messaging. Um, so have a lovely summer break, get the work done. Um, and I hope you have a really great 2024. That sounds disgusting to say 2024, so I think that's a good note to end the lecture on. Uh, thanks, everyone.